Well, let's uh, pray. Father in heaven, there is much mystery contained within the Christian gospel. And though we would never this side of eternity understand it all, we pray we might understand some and be bold enough to even say we would understand more. Uh, Help us now to understand more about the ascension of the Son of God. And this we pray in the Saviour's name. Amen. Well, I want you to have a good Ascension Sunday, and by that I mean I don't want you leaving here bamboozled and complexed and more confused than maybe what you were about the Ascension when you walked in. So how might we have a more engaging and a more fruitful Ascension Sunday? Well, my first advice is maybe this. Stay clear of the painter's. I think our forebears were wrong when they had an absolute blanket ban on the artist in the life of the kirk. I think it's absolutely true that God forbids the painting of his face, but not the painting of his truth. And I think possibly our forebears, uh, John Knox and co., maybe misunderstood that. Yes, there is a ban upon the painting of the face of God, which is an impossibility to paint, but his truth is not impossible to paint. Uh, One great truth which is painted is uh, Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal. Uh, I like that painter, maybe not everybody does, but the way he uses light to highlight the old father's face and the lines of worry that was in that face. Those of you who are parents who maybe can relate to worrying deeply about a child, certainly when they go off the rails and start ruining their life, this man has it etched on his face. And then the release of those lines in the painting, when the young son returns home, changed and renewed. It's a painting of God's truth. It's not a painting of his face. However, you want to stay clear of the painters on Ascension Sunday because quite simply, (laughs) all the paintings I've ever seen are rubbish because they're struggling with the physics. They're more concerned about how the Lord literally ascended than why the Lord ascended. And they are pretty bizarre paintings. Those of you who use Google, go back and try and Google the Ascension. Some have him three feet off the ground, others six feet off the ground. How does he transition between earth and heaven? Does he dematerialize? Does he move into a bright light? How, how do you paint it? So for the ascension, I would say maybe it's more fruitful to actually listen to music. Because the music which has been created to speak about this day is often far more helpful than anything on canvas. Music can change. It can make a transition from one state to another. And really, uh, that depicts the ascension very well. So, just my introductory remark. It was only from my own mind before I turned to the Bible. If you want a good ascension Sunday, listen to the musicians, steer clear of the painters, but of course, you have to search the Scriptures. That's the best place. And we'll search the scriptures now. Verses 53, uh, 52, 51, and 50. I'm going to go in reverse this morning. And the first thing I believe the ascension shows you and me is that we have a great access. The closing verse. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. What I want you to think about here is who is where. And it's them. Well, who is them? Well, it's the people like you and me. It's the the ordinary person who put their faith in Jesus. And where are these ordinary people? Well, they're in the temple. And what are they doing there? They're blessing God. Who's missing? Ordinary people in the temple 
blessing God. You have place, you have people, you have activity, but something's missing. Luke does this a lot in the gospel, I believe. He, he balances the end of his narrative with the beginning. To understand this, you need to go back to Luke 1 verse 8, because this is where Luke's gospel begins. It begins in the temple. It ends in the temple. It begins with God's name being blessed. It ends with God's name being blessed. It begins in the temple, Luke 1 verse 8, with God's name being blessed by a certain kind of person, Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, the religious professional. The gospel begins by showing you Without Jesus Christ, you have these professionals who do all the glorifying of God, maybe on your behalf, certainly on behalf of the church and the nation. And by the end of the gospel, after Jesus has been crucified, resurrected and ascended, who can bless God and who can bless others? You can. Do you make the most of this access? Sometimes we might think, well, of course I make the most of that access. But then people get cross when the minister never visited the person before they died. And if only, they say, that minister could have come. Were the prayers of the minister more important to God than the prayers of the lady about to become a widow? Were the prayers of the elder who was at the bedside five hours beforehand, less important than the prayers that the minister would have offered. The Ascension Sunday tells us we now, all of us, have great access to God. I like to think of it like this. There's only one preacher in this kirk, but there's many priests. One preacher with a congregation of priests, and you're the priest, it is absolutely possible for you to walk down the street and to say to a person who tells you something, imagine they tell you something good. Could you dare say, thanks for telling me that? I'm going to give God thanks for that. Because often we only convey to people we speak to God when it's negative. Oh, are you struggling? I'll pray to the Lord for you about that. Are you worried? I'll ask God bless you about that. Do you know what? It may be a very um, effective missionary skill to say to a person who tells you good news, well, I'm going to thank God later about that. You are able to have access to God. It doesn't make me redundant. <laughs> I just have a different function. Secondly, we not only have a great access to God, but we have a great elevation. Verses 51 and 52. While Jesus blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. They worshipped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Why were they in joy, do you think, watching a physical Jesus uh, go into glory? I have to admit that sometimes I love toying with atheists, sparring with them and messing with their minds. And one such technique that I have always enjoyed is saying to them, I don't believe in the God you don't believe in either. Because normally the atheist has studied a very narrow strata of God and normally it contains a lot of caricatures, which you and me would not actually believe in anyway. One such caricature is, who wants to go there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever, sitting in some white, smoky, cloudy environment, floating around in some horrendous spiritual reality? What kind of life is that? It's even lesser than this life now. You know that picture from the Philadelphia advert from the 1980s when everything was white and smoky and white wings on people's backs. No color and next to no sound other than very high-pitched 
angelic frequencies. Ask yourself this in these two verses. Who takes a body to a disembodied reality? Surely the ascension shows you Jesus Christ transitioned a physical body into this reality called eternity. He takes a glorified physical body and he takes it from earth into this thing the Bible calls heaven. He takes it from what physicists call time into what physicists call eternity or timelessness. Who takes a body to a disembodied state? Well, nobody. You would only take a body to an embodied reality, wouldn't you? Like this one. And so St. Paul tells us in the book of Romans, this universe in which you are living is like the mother's womb. That's how he describes it. He says it's like a woman in labor, travailing. And when the Lord comes back for the final great act in salvation, that's the birthing process. Think about the child in the womb. Can the child hear when it's inside the womb? Yes, it can. Can it hear more when it's on this side of the womb? Answer, yes. Is the child aware of temperature inside the womb? It must, in some sense, be aware of temperature. But is it more aware of temperature outside of the womb? Yes, it is. Is it aware of touch when the midwife presses against it to try to move it into the right position before they're born? You think the child can sense that, that pressure? I'm sure it can. But is that the same as when a spouse embraces that child when it's an adult? No. So is there less sense or more sense this side of the mother's womb? And the answer is, there is more. Is there more life or less life? More music, more touch, more sensory awareness, more intellectual process. Is there more or less this side of our mother's womb? And it's simple, there's more. And so it is with the ascension of the Son of God. As he goes into eternity to sit at the right hand of the Father, I'm saying the spectrum of color that you see now is like that. The spectrum of color in glory is beyond our measurement. The sound of frequencies that you can tolerate in your eardrums now. All music is made within a very small spectrum of sound, of frequency. I'm saying the music of eternity has a spectrum or a frequency range we cannot measure the heavenly music or the heavenly touch or the heavenly intellectual or emotional processes. There is a great elevation on Ascension Sunday. The Lord takes a body to an embodied state where we will be one day. So there is great elevation. There is great access. These are not concepts we cannot even begin to get our heads around. We can begin to get our heads around. And finally, there's great authority. The last verse. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands... He blessed them. In the Old Testament, the, the blessing of lifting up your hands over people from Abraham, from David, kings, prophets, from priests, Melchizedek, the great king priest. And how Luke ends the gospel is he says this, heaven's best is where you find the blessing. not earth's worst. Heaven's best is where blessing comes, not earth's worst. Where's earth's worst happening this morning? Well, any cursory uh, moving through the television channels? You know, all those people who walked the streets last year because a black man was criminally murdered in America? Will they walk the streets this year because of all the children killed in the Middle East? I hope so. 
all those multi-million pound football players who I'm sure it wasn't just tokenism because the SPL or the English FA demanded to go down on their knee for BLM. Will they go down on their knee for PLM? The Palestinian lives matter. Or are they not black enough? You see, the world is full of Earth's worst and all its empty blessings and empty tokenisms. Those football players on their knees was a joke. It was an empty token. Earth's worst. In Christ, you have heaven's best. I believe if the Lord Jesus was permitted by the people in those lands to bless their hearts, they would share the land. And if they let him bless them today, there would be peace there tomorrow. But there will never be peace there until the Prince of Peace is there. But in some small way, even in our own lives, you know, we choose for earth's worst rather than heaven's best. But the Ascension Sunday shows you, look, you can have heaven's best in your life. Jesus blessing you. You don't need to pray to a saint. You have him working for you. There's a great elevation and there is great access. Listen to the musicians articulate that. Avoid the painters. Search the scriptures. And you'll have a good and a fruitful Ascension Sunday. Amen. And thanks be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, world without end.